afternoon and welcome to this lecture entitled, entitled Le Sieur de Machy and the un Unaccompanied French by Flame of the 17th Century. Before I begin this lecture, I would like to take a moment and thank Professor Mind, Professor Edward, and Professor Plain for their guidance and support in preparation of this lecture. When playing and accompanied music written for the viol in the second half of the 17th century, Questions regarding performance practice naturally arise, including issues of articulation, sonority, ornamentation, and fingering. The most important primary source for this question is the preface from Le Cieux de Machy, Pièce de Viol, which was published in 1685, the first publication for solo viol to be published in France. In its long preface, the machine writes how he believes the viol should sound, how one should play. The machine is an invaluable source of information because he primarily addresses performance practice concerning an accompanied viol playing. Furthermore, his music and writing suggest that he was an accomplished player and well, well aware of the latest advances and trends in the music of his time. This lecture recital will explore the machine's writing in an attempt to clarify issues related to performance practice in this repertory. Perhaps the first concern that arises when playing music for an accompanied viol by composers such as de Machy and his contemporaries, Jean Dubuisson, Monsieur de saint Colomb, and Jean Mahé, is how to deal with the fact that you are playing without accompaniment. One might feel that the music is em empty and disjunct. To resolve this issue, one must consider what the gumbists of the time had as reference of sound, and how they dealt with the fact that they were playing unaccompanied. For the machine, the viol was primarily an harmonic instrument. This means an, an instrument that primarily plays chords and counterpoint instead of single melody. It had close ties regarding sonority and technique with all the instruments of this sort, such as harpsichord, but especially the fiogo and lute. The machine states, quote, there are two groups of instruments. One play only melody, such as the flute, violin, and discus de viol. The others, the lute, harpsichord, fiogo, and the bass viol are properly harmonic instruments. The true method of playing the bass viol is a solo instrument in the harmonic style, and you can do this as well as the fiogo and harpsichord. In quotes. Furthermore, many gamba players also played lute, guitar, and fiogo. By 1680s, the connection between viol and plucked instrument was already fully rooted. The theorist Sebastien de Poussard claims that Nicolas Ottoman introduced the fiogo to France. Ottoman was one of the most important French viol players of the middle of the 17th century and was teacher of Dubuisson, de Machy, and Saint Colomb. Brossard writes of the Fiogo that, quote, this instrument has been around for 50 or 60 years. It is claimed that Sir Ottoman, so famous for his playing and pieces for the bass viol, was its inventor in France, where its use was introduced from Italy and elsewhere, in quote. We can assume that Hot Ottman's viol playing was influenced by the fiogo through the shared articulation, sonority, ornamentation, and left hand posture. This influence of the fiogo playing style on his viol playing was presumably passed on to his students, who were renowned viol players. Besides the fiogo or its older sibling, the lute, French viol playing of the second half of the 17th century was also influenced by the English little way of playing the viol. The little way consists of playing chords and polyphony on the viol. John Playford describes this style of playing the viol in the middle of the 17th century as follows. Quote, this way of playing the viol is as, as late invention, in imitation of old English lute or bandura. In quote. This style of playing was brought to France by Henri Mugard, he spent four years in the 1620s at the English court, where he observed the, the Lira viol style. Mugar was the first known French viol virtuoso and teacher of Ottoman. 
this English chordal and polyphonic style of playing the viol, which Playford claims came from imitating Lutinus, was passed down to Ottoman and from him to De Machy and his contemporaries. Therefore, we can assume that the French practice of playing chords and counterpoints on the viol in the late 17th century had its roots in the early 17th century England, and that it follows the lyre viol style. By De Machy time, the practice of playing an accompanied viol in the harmonic style was almost a hundred years old, with a long tradition and vast repertoire. One essential characteristic of these harmonic instruments is that they create a great deal of resonance, ringing, and overlapping notes. The player of the viol should attempt to emulate these instruments while playing the viol in order to avoid emptiness and end disjunction that one might feel when playing this music. The player should leave the fingers pressing the strings down after releasing the bow from that string. This technique promotes great resonance since stop notes, fr since stop notes from different strings will be ringing. Because of this, contrapuntal voices can be heard more clearly, clearly, which helps the coherence of the music. This technique is called hold or tenue and is found in English and French sources for the viol, lute, guitar, and harpsichord. It was notated with a line on, or dash. De Machy writes, quote, one must be careful to use the required fingerings while observing the hold, which are very important to maintain the, ha the harmony. The tenu ordinaire is marked with a line to show that one must not lift the finger from, from the note or the lattice until all those included in it are finished. The tenue de note is marked by notes themselves, as on the harpsichord, by holding the fingers on the longest in value and not lifting them until all those contained within it are also finished." The prelude by De Machine, figure two, as you can see in the first page of the handout, is a good example when one should play, when one should apply the holds. Not applying the hold in this situation will make the music sound chopped. More importantly, note will not note will not overlap and ring. This creates confusion since the notes they are supposed to ring over several following notes, in order to imply harmony and counterpoint, will not be heard. Moreover. Most of the holds are written when the music leaps over more than one string or between registers. Applying the holds in these situations is crucial. There will be emptiness in the music if one does not if one does not hold the finger pressing the string down to let the string ring while playing a falling cross string. The machine also often apply holds in cadence due to the same reason. One often takes time after a cadence, and if one does not hold the finger down after releasing the bow from, from the string, the sound will cease, creating emptiness. How one uses the bow is also of extreme importance. The machine does not mention how bio players should use the bow. However, through his writing, we know that he's mainly concerned with resonance, ringing, and imitating the sound of plucked instruments. To achieve that, one should play with caution to avoid letting the bow remain on the string after the stroke, since this will cause the string to stop vibrating. Furthermore, a slow bow stroke will not produce enough ringing. One should play with a fast bow stroke and immediately release the bow from the string in a way that resembles the plucking or pizzicato of a lute or kyoko. Using a 17th century bow, using a 17th century clipping bow like this one, will help the player achieve the light and fast bow stroke necessary for this music. Clipping bows lack of screw mechanism and were concave with the tip of the bow pointing downward. They possess great, great agility and fast response, great inequality of sound, gesture, and articulation. Figures three to six, which can be found on the second page of, of the handout, are just a small sample of a vast iconography from around 1660, 
that suggests that this type of bow was still the norm in the second half of the 17th century. By the end of the 17th century, uh, bows with screw mechanisms became increasingly more common. However, they were still concave, similar to the mid 17th century bows. Fingering and which exact string to play was also a great concern to the gambits of the time. Stopping a note on a string or playing on an open string can bring completely different outcome. Because of that, tablature was commonly used for notation during this time, since it tells the player which fret and string to play. Both Donoville and Jean Rousseau's Bios treaties from 1687 are concerned with teaching how to read it. Regarding the use of tablature, the machine states, quote, I say therefore that it is very certain that one can learn to play much better in this manner by tablature than in music. For proof of this, it is known for proof of this, it is known that music is subject to various key changes. That one must observe flat and sharp, and in addition, unison, not only on the open string, but also on those which are not. Furthermore, very often these notes should be doubled on those strings which are open. And one quite frequently, quite frequently encounters chords in the same string, which is necessary to make on other strings, which causes great confusion, especially to those who are beginners, and this discourages them. For this reason, tablature is used for pieces for the lute, the oboe, guitar, and other instruments with a neck, which only make harmony since all these difficulties are not encountered with such instruments. The Italian, Germans, Poles, Swedes, Danes, and English have, uh, have always followed this maxim, and the illustrious Monsieur Ottmann also used it for teaching, and it can be proved by several pieces written in his hand in Paris and elsewhere." End quote. Based on the machine statement, we learned that viol players of the time were concerned with which string to play. To stop a note or to play as open string, and either to play a note as a simple unison or as a double unison. This was not a no novel concept, since he claimed that Ottman used tablature to teach his students exactly which strings to play. We can learn a great deal about how viol players of the time fingered their pieces by looking at Demachie's music, written in this notational system. Demachie's publication be becomes even more important due to the fact that it's the only surviving source for the solo viol in France written in tablature. Most of this entablated music was never published, only written manuscript, and does not survive. Looking at the first system from the same prelude in figure seven, which can be found on the second page of the handout, one can notice that Dimashi often uses double unison, which are represented by letter A and F on top of each other. This is done in order to create more resonance and sound out of the instrument. Moreover, he chooses to play double unisons most on D and A because in this piece, these are important notes to the harmony being the tonic and, domi and dominant, respectively. On the last two seasons of the prelude, the machine uses a chain of suspensions, moving the bass downwards, stepwise. He chooses to keep the suspended notes as in open strings, written uh, as an A over the lines. Stopping some of these notes would make this passage easier to play. However, his goal here is to overlap the suspended notes with the bass notes in order to create dissonance. <coughs> now, I will address some technical difficulties that might arise when playing this unaccompanied viol pieces, especially difficulties found in the music of Demachi and Saint Cologne, and how Demachi and his contemporaries' writing might help us to overcome these challenges. First is how to deal with the many chords and double stops that occur in this repertory. One might find that playing as many double stops can be tiring for the hand, and that this can be problematic for the player's endurance. 
However, the answer for this problem lies in how the machine positions his left hand. Regarding the position of the left hand of Fodemann, the machine states, quote, it must be noticed, therefore, that there are two left hand positions for the viol, just as for the lute, the oboe, and guitar. The first is to put the thumb in the middle of the neck and the first finger opposite to the thumb, always rounded, except when one is obliged to lay it flat. The wrist must also be round and the elbow a little raised. This position is used whenever one is not obliged to extend the hand." End quote. The machine states that there are two left hand pos positions. The first one is echoed by Christopher Simpson in his treatise The Division Vial. He states, quote, when you are to set your fingers upon the string, you must not grasp your neck of you must not grasp the neck of your viol like the violin, but rather, as those that play on the lute, keep your thumb on the back of the neck, opposite to your fourth finger. So as your hand may have the liberty to remove up and down as occasion shall require. Simpson's treatise is considered to have been the most influential music treatise of its day. And it's possible that the machine managed to acquire it, since he was aware of the practice of many foreign gambits. Concerning the tenu, the machine states, quote, in regard to tenu, if one e examines the pieces of foreign altars, which are famous, one will see that the rules are indeed <coughs> observed there, and therefore it should not pass as novelty, end quote. In this hand position, the thumb and index finger lie across each other. This is the most natural position, as it's the position where the fingers go when the hand is at rest. This favors chordal and polyphonic playing because the more relaxed and close position of the hand results in more hand and finger strength, and it becomes easier to press several strings at the same time. Figurations such as those shown in figure 9 in the third page of the handout, where the first and second finger are held down in order to make the chord ring to the following notes, while the third and fourth finger plays a melody on the upper strings, becomes more attainable. However, this hand position should only be used when one does not need to do extensions. For passage with extensions, the machine advises the players to switch to another position. He writes, quote, and for the second left hand position where one must extend the hand, it is necessary to place the thumb closer to the edge of the neck, the second finger opposite to the thumb, with the first finger more extended, unless a chord makes it necessary to have it rounded. The wrist in this position is not as round as the first position. For the elbow, it should be against the hip, so all that one cannot do in one must be ob observed in the other. And by this means, one can play everything without difficulty." In quote. The second left hand position is not as natural to the hand as the first one, due to the placement of the thumb. However, doing extensions become easier. Extension is the term used whenever the hand needs to extend in order to reach two whole steps without shifting. Once the hand is switched to that position, the hand only needs to move the first finger towards the direction of the pad. Applying these two different hand positions to their respective scenarios will help the left hand achieve relaxation when performing this music. Altogether, this creates musical flow. So, I'm going to show here the left position, the first position, the hand is at rest, naturally, rest like this. So, with the forefinger against the thumb, and the elbow a little bit raised, that's how you should play most of the chords and passages like that. So it lies like this. And that's the, the front. As for the second pos position, the thumb goes against the hip. The thumb, uh, sorry, the elbow goes against the hip. The thumb goes against the second finger and the thumb goes at the edge, edge of, the, of the neck. So in order to, you just have to 
extend your first finger towards the peg and you can achieve two whole steps. The second technical difficulty that might arise is reaching the low A, the low A string, especially when it's approached from upper D or A string, and when it needs to be reached quickly. Some of modern players that experience this difficulty play the violin in inclined angle, with the neck of the violin perpendicular to the floor, and with the peg head behind the head. Many of these musicians were cellists before gumbas and therefore often brought an aspect of modern cello playing into the viral technique playing. Even though the machine does not mention the position of an instrument in relation to the body, Danoville, a contemporary, does. Danoville writes, quote, the neck of the viral must be distanced from the left eye by half foot, and to be able to play a low string, the viral must be in upright position, end quote. Furthermore, this statement is supported by iconography. The last issue that I shall address is ornamentation, since the machine description of ornaments differs somewhat from his contemporaries. Knowing that different instruction regarding ornaments can, can help the gumbest make a better historically informed decision while reading from manuscript. First, we need, we need to have in mind not only that ornaments or agreement were considered very important to French music of this time, but also how these ornaments were executed. Musicians of the time define good taste as a correlation between what is appropriate and what is not, the needed ornament and what would be perceived as excess. Dussault, in his treatise for the viol, gives us an insight concerning ornament. Quote, ornaments are to the voice and to the instrument what ornaments are to a building. They are not necessary for the structure of the building, as they serve only to make it more agreeable to the eye. Likewise, an air for the voice and a piece for instruments can be fundamentally correct, yet we will not satisfy the ear if it's not ornamented with appropriate ornament. Still, too great of a quantity of ornaments will produce a type of confusion which will make the building less agreeable. Similarly, the confusion of ornament in airs and in pieces serve only to diminish the view." End quote. Notable ornaments from Ottman, Du Buisson, and saint Colomb are known, and their musical intentions are expressed by only a few signs. The most common sign is the coma, which is a trill, most likely starting on the upper note. However, Donneville, Rousseau, and Demachy publications are a va valuable source about viol ornaments in the second half of the 17th century. Demachy tables of ornament in figure 10, third page of the handout, from Pièce de Viol, is probably the most complex ornament source for the French viol of the time. The trio, which is called Treblement or Cadence, is the most important ornament. By this time in France, it began with the, with the upper auxiliary note. One must notice that the machine instruction regarding the trill differs from other viol treaties of the time. He states that the speed of the ornamental notes should be even. Danneville, however, states that it should start slow and speed up in the end. The machine also describes a trill that begins on the main note without, the, without an upper auxiliary note, which he, he names as battement. He introduced the petit treblement, which is in essence just a note preceded by an upper auxiliary note and is notated as a small comma. Other writers do not mention this ornament. The machine has a sign for mordant with one repetition and another sign for the mordant with two repetitions. He calls this the matelement and double matelement, respectively. However, he is the only one to use this sign amongst his peers. On the other hand, Donville calls it pensé, and he states that the number of blows or repetition depends on its length. Batelement is a trio. Oh, 
it's clear that Demachie's table that one could combine different ornaments. The Pot de Voix, which consists of an appoggiatura, could, could be combined with Mottel Mount. Even though Rousseau writes that Pot de Voix is inseparable, inseparable from Mottel Mount, one can often find a Pot de Voix by itself in the music of Demachie. Furthermore, the Tablement and Petit Tablement could be combined with Mottel Mount. A surprise to, to the modern player is that slurs were considered ornaments. They could be employed in order to change articulation, to make a bow retake, or to make a, cro a string cross easier. We can deduce from Rousseau's writing on ornaments that players probably had to improvise their own, since he addressed primarily playing ornaments extempore, or improvised. One could add all of these ornaments when appropriate, even if there is no markings for it. With the exception of, the, of published music, ornaments and also bridges between sections were often not written out. Furthermore, chords could also be added. This practice, which is borrowed from flat instruments, helps to fill the music and reinforce the harmony. The version in figure 11, on the third page of the handout, represents ex excerpts of an element by Louis song without ornamental additions. Figure 12, in contrast, depicts the second version of the same element and how one might and how one might add ornaments and chords. To summarize then, when playing the unaccompanied French violin repertory of the second half of the 17th century, Gambis should seek to produce the sonority of collected instruments, such as the viola or lute. This achieves in four ways. First, by means of articulation, applying the technique of plucking with the bow sound. This is easier to be accomplished with a 17th century clipping bow. Second, by means of resonance, ringing, and overlapping notes. This is achieved by leaving the fingers pressing down the notes after the bow has been released from the string. Third, by using as many open strings and double unison as possible. Fourth, by adding ornaments and chords when appropriate, especially in music preserved from manuscript. Applying the machine two different left hand positions and the view position of the viol will enable the player to execute chords and string cross more easily, thus helping the player achieve an effort level of musical flow. I will, uh, now I would like to take uh, this time uh, to take any questions from the audience, if there is quite any. Yeah. Did uh, Gigi Song, Alamon, put the ornaments on the outfit ornaments? Did he publish those like side by side? No, no, no. So the first one mm -hmm. is how is in the manuscript, uh -huh. and the second one is how you can add uh, ornaments and bridges. Oh, did you? Did you Yes, I put those ornaments, yeah. yeah. So since I'm someone who, do, uh, who doesn't have any knowledge about uh, Viola de Gamba, I'm uh, uh, curious to know how did you choose this topic and how did you fell in love into Viola de Gamba? <laughs> yeah, because, oh, uh, well, this topic, it's, uh, it's an interesting topic because it's, uh, it's already Baroque French viola playing, but it's the earlier part. And we as a Gambist, we usually tend to focus on the later French repertory of Mahé and Fouquet-Hé. So this early repertory, which I love, um, sometimes um, could be given more attention. So I chose this topic. Thank you. So you said you needed sometimes to achieve two whole steps in your, in your playing hand. So I'm wondering if at this time period, I feel like it was really uncommon to play upper extensions and chords, but are, is that being, is that, aspect of harmony being conveyed very often on the gamba. On the gamba, actually, during this time, it did a lot of chords everywhere. And, and by this time, um, there is also a lot of extension starting to be um, required. So two whole steps. And, and if you go later, like 50 years or later, um, chords are not as much as done, but extensions are even more done. So it's kind of like the extensions start to take more and more space out of uh, chords. 
Yeah. Uh, when you have uh, the cortisol combined with the best small, that uh -huh. cortisol is always from below? Yes. Uh, at least I didn't find any source from this time for the bio. But there, there are cortisol by themselves that come from above. I, from above. I didn't. I, I haven't found. Okay, so yeah. if it comes from above, it's either a short or a long trill. Yes. And if it comes from below, it, it's a cortisol that goes in for the back small. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, they call cortisol is coming from below, and if it comes from above, is a terrible amount. And, and, and is it clear whether that cortisol is happening on the beat? Mm, it's not clear. I think. I haven't, I haven't found anything saying strictly, at least from these three sources that right. I've, I've studied. They just don't say it wasn't doing that. Yeah. But you would assume. I would assume yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All yeah, right. There, there are flute sources um, that that are very rare. Uh -huh. um, but I think most people assume that those are infection, and that's why they're notated carefully that way. I think it was like uh, an imitation of some vocal uh, mm. version of a, mm -hmm. of a chord of All right. So I, I have prepared a selection of a few pieces to demonstrate this topic. I hope you enjoy it.